I'm, uh, my name's Jerry Spiegel. I'm a professor in the School of Population and Public Health and the Lew Institute for Global Issues. And uh, at the University of British Columbia, an area that, uh, that I'm especially involved in is global health research with a focus on what's framed as determinants of health. But as you'll see in the paper, we're challenging some of that idea to say, gee, maybe we should look more critically at what it is we're trying to get at with determinants of health. And let me explain to you a bit of why we developed kind of this paper and the significance for, for you or for people who are actually starting to look at health research and, and the methods. Because what we're really trying to do in this paper is look reflectively ourselves and critically to say, well, what is it that we're really doing through, uh, through the research exercise? So let me give you some background. Um, we developed a collaboration with colleagues in Ecuador uh, about 10 years ago with um, the goal of developing kind of and strengthening research capacity in that country. And it was in a program that was linking Canadian universities and uh, universities uh, around the world, really, in this case. Uh, we developed this relationship and we were increasingly impressed and intrigued at the research traditions we were encountering there. Now we were partnered with some universities that were weaker, that were, that, that were less developed, but we had the good fortune to connect with some very strong researchers who interestingly came with different traditions. So let me explain that. We look at health less from our group at kind of treatment and diagnosis, which is critically important, but our focus in population and public health is to say what are the factors that can affect health, and more importantly, what can we do about it? And we apply something called an ecosystem approach to human health, which is an orientation that looks at a variety of disciplines that affect health and affect and processes and factors that are often referred to as determinants and as well looks at the capacities of different people who are involved to address it, be they institutions, be they affected communities, be they government, and with a real focus on equity. So the key focus from this approach was above all to think transdisciplinary, so not just looking at traditional health sciences, but look at a range of things. To look at the participation in the interventions to deal with it, and as well, what's it all for and what's the equity? What's, what are the marginalized populations who are affected by poor health? How do they fare? And that should be at the center. Now, in our work, we kind of would address questions like uh, pesticides in the production of food and what that would mean, like poor sanitation, like dengue, a variety of factors. And we would try to bring this together to facilitate universities working with a range of disciplines and with the communities that are affected. Now we had a kind of a very interesting time and met with a, a lot of success uh, some of which then led not only to student research papers, but then in turn led to internationally funded research projects. But what we learned as we were developing this relationship is, is maybe we should be looking more systematically and critically at the, the, the areas where we were doing our research. So in this paper, and I'll explain to you some of the, the different areas, um, we started to say, well, if we look at questions of food and its relation to health, we could look more narrowly at things like nutrition, which is important. So we don't want to only look in a biomedical way at how to deal with people who are, who are experiencing problems with poor nutrition, but what are the factors that, say, affect good nutrition and healthy eating options and things like that. But then we have to perhaps look even more comprehensively 
and look at how is food being produced and what impact that may be having on health. So instead of just looking narrowly at one determinant as an alternative to taking a narrow biomedical interpretation, whereas we were led to the orientation by our colleagues in, in Latin America to be looking at the processes that systematically develop patterns that affect health negatively. And in Latin America, we learned, there was a very strong tradition that was looking at problems of equity and concentrating on what they framed in Spanish as collective health or approaches to critical epidemiology that would start to look more broadly. And in doing that, the focus, as we explain in the paper, is on critical processes of social determination of health. So in a sense, we're embracing the, the move that's taken place in our traditions in the global north or in Canada that are increasingly recognized what's called, what are called social determinants of health, but saying, no, we have to push our tools of research and our approaches of research a little further to look at the systematic patterns to really get more to root causes and to embrace that in the actual methods we apply. So for example, I took the, 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 the case of food and nutrition. We want to go beyond just looking at what influences healthy eating and in fact we've developed, we have a research program in Ecuador that's looking in Ecuador and Canada at what affects health equity in terms of food systems, but rather than just looking at these factors, we said what are the processes that could be affecting health? And one of the key things in terms of food systems that's been receiving a lot of attention is the notion of food sovereignty, which embraces the idea that the people who are involved in the food systems should have their own independence respected, they should be having full uh, range of options. So in the case of, of consumers, that means having access to healthy choices and having those options open. But, but as well for producers, it means being able to produce in ways that are more in harmony with the values of the community. So in the case of Ecuador, there are a lot of small producers that were very resistant to the idea of free trade putting, creating disruptions for their food production and also wanting to produce in a way that was more harmonious with nature. A lot of these are, are indigenous producers. So what they had done uh, was joined part of a worldwide movement of food sovereignty. So the framing that we actually wanted to take in terms of looking at health and uh, health equity, specifically in food, was to say, well, what is the influence of, of taking an approach to food sovereignty, to reducing some of the negative effects, be they the poor nutrition we see when we see a, a push towards processed foods that they're experiencing in the global south, as we are in the global north, but also towards having production methods that are agro-industrial, i.e. heavy uses of chemicals and pesticides that produce negative local effects to the producing communities and the workers who are involved. So if we say, if we looked at, at this notion of food sovereignty, it would mean looking more comprehensively and hence this became a very nice example of what it meant to look at social processes of determination as opposed to narrowly at determinants. And when we looked at what this means for the research we would do, we started to not only look at negative effects, but look at the positive options that could be created through interventions and making that part of our study design itself. I'll give you kind of another example because we systematically then were encouraged to be thinking through the broader implications for research at a meeting of all the research programs in Canada that were looking at health equity and they were intrigued by how we were 
adapting the Latin American emphasis on collective health, on social processes of health determination. And frankly, it was at a workshop that we were encouraged to develop this further in terms of broader applications. So what we tried to do in this paper was apply it to five different areas of the global health research programs uh, activities. And I'm going to give you one more example of what that meant. One of the areas that we deal with that is frightfully important but often ignored is the health of health workers. We know when we're talking about global health, we see a real poor distribution of where the health, the human health resources are in relation to need. And we also see that uh, we have negative pressures being put forward by the, the wealthier global north that's actually attracting physicians away that creates more intense workloads in the countries that they're leaving, like South Africa, which is another country where we work. So the focus of our research program is, and it builds on experience that team members had in Canada, was how can we strengthen the work environment for health workers themselves? Because health workers have typically, their health has actually been, been neglected. But when you look at an under-resourced area like South Africa that's facing heavy workloads, you have real pressures in terms of multi-drug resistant tuberculosis, which is also a challenge that they're facing in Ecuador if we don't have the proper protection. Now, traditionally, when you look at research in this area, you will look at the biological and the physical um, and chemical hazards that workers face, which is a, a very effective way of narrowing in on what are the threats to one's health and what can one do about it. But by taking a social determination of health approach, we wanted to have more focus, what we often call upstream, on factors or processes that were aggravating these problems. So we, can, we embrace the notion of looking at specific sets of hazards and what you can do about it. But for example, we wanted to look at broader patterns and ways to intervene. So when it came to the health of health workers, as we described in the article, we wanted to also look at questions that affected the intensifications of work and the poor alignment of resources that are available to actually pay attention and create better work environments. And we kind of noted that one of the positive trends that we see internationally, which is greater attention to health equity and primary care, may inadvertently be aggravating work intensity and work organizational challenges for health workers. And our point in this is, is to emphasize that health equity is, is frightfully important for health workers as well, and indirectly, the better conditions health workers have, the better chance and likelihood that populations and marginalized populations as a whole will have access to the services they need. But if in fact the attention to the health of health workers is not attended to, then there's going to be shortfalls, there's going to be an aggravation of issues. So we were suggesting through this research approach that we should be more systematically looking at the consequences of certain sets of policies and seeing how this could either aggravate, but better than that, improve the way these working conditions are experienced. So therefore, the more proximal, which is a language we use for close to you, uh, hazards, for example, like poor ventilation for uh, exposure to tuberculosis, which could aggravate that, could be remedied through greater attention to funding and policies and priority setting in the health sector. So these are examples of, of how we have a challenge when we look at population health to look at different levels, levels that are very close, that give us a good understanding of what's really at risk, 
but often at a meso or mezzo level, as we discuss in the paper, where you see the sets of policies that affect kind of a local environment, but often at a macro level, you look at what actually predisposes certain approaches to take place that could actually have a lot of consequence and be predictive of, of improved health. So when you look at this paper, um, I'd like you to try to grasp three things. One, there's the challenge of looking at what scale or at what level we consider a health problem to be manifest. Um, two, that we consider that there are different kind of strategies that we can take when we approach a problem. Um, and that's why we try to take this as a bit of a tool reflectively and critically at what we do. So this is, in addition, it's a way to have a, a little bit of a reflection on what different priorities are and what you could then add through your research effort. And then finally, um, that there's different ways of knowing and we take certain things for granted kind of culturally like when we look at the approach that has been more common, for example, in scholarship in the North, that has embraced the language of determinants as opposed to looking reactively at a biomedical illness-oriented treatment and diagnosis uh, restrictive phase. This is frightfully important, but it has to be part of something bigger. But what we learned, and this was really cross-culturally in working you know, with our colleagues from the Global South who had to deal with these systemic problems of inequality is that there are actually some very nicely developed theoretical orientations that support us in this quest for looking at what the systemic processes are. So the last point that I make is we have a lot of learning that we could do in both directions when we work between Global North and Global South and we really uh, are very enthusiastic about, uh, about the collaborations and very appreciative to be in this opportunity uh, to do this mutual learning. So I, I hope you'll have the same opportunities that, that our team has had. Thanks.